And Jesus calls for all of humanity to turn away, repent, uh, from evil and join the kingdom of God. And you begin this by believing in your heart that um, God raised Jesus from the dead, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and being baptized into his name. So that is the gospel message. Now the question is, what happens to those that reject the gospel? And this is colloquially called the problem of hell. Scary, spooky. Um, as our danger scale tonight, we're going to keep it at a beginner level. There are only 18 unique slides, which is a record for me. That might be the fewest. So it'll be nice and, nice and easy, all right? So what is the problem, all right? Um, and we're going to walk through here on the outline. So there are a lot of different ways we can approach the problem of hell. One would be to go through an exegetical discussion. What does the Bible say? Things like that. But we're just going to come at it very directly, all right? So usually we do Alvin the Atheist as our stand-in. Today we have a new character, uh, Arthur the Aardvark. What's the problem, Arthur? So Arthur says, I'm concerned about the justice of hell. It doesn't seem right for God to torture people forever for sins that are committed in a finite life. Okay, that's the problem. Piece of advice, it's okay to be uncertain. Like this is a very difficult topic. The church has argued about it for centuries and there are a lot of different perspectives. So here are three uh, perspectives. So here's what Francine has to say. Actually, Arthur, the Bible doesn't teach eternal torment. It teaches the condemned will be annihilated. Eternal torment is a later doctrinal accretion. So your concern about eternal torment just isn't founded in Scripture. That's Francine's answer. Muffy has another answer. She says, actually, Arthur, hell really isn't about punishment and retribution. The condemned freely choose to separate themselves from God, and God respects that. And so he doesn't torment them in some sort of evil torture chamber. He just lets them exist in this uh, way that's separated from himself. And it turns out that being separated from God is pretty close to uh, torment. But it's not torment from God. It's tor uh, torment from separation from God. And finally, Binky says, Actually, Arthur, in rejecting an infinitely holy God, the condemned have warranted infinite punishment. And besides, are they really going to repent in hell? It's not like they're going to bend the knee. They're going to continue uh, for the rest of their entire existence cursing God. So whatever torment they experience, they will accrue even more sin and more punishment in the fires of hell. You should read some Aquinas, says Binky. So these are three different perspectives. Okay? What do we think? Arthur is, that's Arthur. Yes. I am uncomfortable with this delivery mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what's her name? Muffy? The one in the middle or the yeah, one at the top? I guess her and Binky mm -hmm. would um, disagree. Mm -hmm. like, I feel like it's the complete opposite of one another. Yeah. Well, they all disagree. Yeah. Anybody else have some initial thoughts? You have an initial thought? Is, uh, the first one mentions uh, eternal torment being a later doctrinal accretion. Mm -hmm. So is that position claiming to be the first one to the church? Yeah, it's saying the biblical view is um, that there's no eternal torment. There is... Um, there's just annihilation, like, and um, that the people that go to hell just cease to exist. And right. so there's not like this ongoing thing. All claim the biblical view, but like, right. if we could look back at what the first Christians were seeing mm -hmm. and think of it, what is their confusion even then? Oh, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to that in a bit. Yeah, we'll get to that in a bit, but yeah, that, but that's what she's claiming. She's saying that this idea, it's, it's like, uh, well, I don't want to be too pejorative. Uh, but it would be kind of like, um, well, I, like I said, I don't want to be pejorative, <laughs> but uh, some of the more elaborate uh, rituals that are practiced are, you know, that, that clearly were not based on, on the New Testament, but were later added. Yeah. Any other initial thoughts? Yeah, so the one on the top is Francine. Sure. Okay. <laughs> sure? Okay. Yeah, her. <laughs> Um, she says that eternal torment is a later doc, like later. Like, how yeah. does that? How how would that manifest later? A good question. We'll 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 get to that. Okay. Yeah, th that's a good question. But the basic idea is just that there are. So think about like. Okay, here's an example. Here's a non. Um, here's an example where it goes both ways. Take for example the question of baptizing babies or baptizing infants specifically. So, 
One side says, we, um, you know, we should baptize babies as far as we can tell from the earliest of uh, church history, there has been baptizing of infants. And one side says, um, and, and you are the newcomers because it's only in the 1600s that believer's baptism was a thing. And the other side says, no, actually, um, the early church didn't baptize infants, but in the like 400s, then people started baptizing infants, and we have recovered the New Testament teaching and uh, to only baptize believers. So that's an example of like, both groups are trying to say that the other one is new on the scene. And obviously they're incompatible positions, so one has to go back to the New Testament. So this is the same thing. One group is saying, um, actually this idea of eternal torment in hell, that is a new concept, relatively speaking. It was brought about like in the 400s, 500s, and it became the dominant view, but it wasn't the view of the New Testament. Does that make sense? Okay. So, thank you for indulging me on my little Arthur thing. Let's make this a, former, a formal argument. So we have these three sort of propositions here, or theses, if you will. The first one is the thesis of eternal torment. Hell consists of eternal conscious torment in body and soul. The second is retribution, and that is to say that the purpose of hell is to mete out punishment specifically to those whose earthly lives warrant it. And thirdly is the idea of justice. Eternal torment is an unjust punishment for a finite earthly life, no matter how evil that life is. And so as phrased, you can't have all three of these, right? They contradict each other. And so the question is, which one are we going to reject? And so I'm going to discuss um, three strategies on rejecting each one of them. So first, we're going to look at this question of eternal torment. Um, what do Christians who reject this statement, what do they say? So first we need to decide, or first we need to get a little bit of clarity, like what are we talking about when we talk about hell? So the idea is, in Christian eschatology, or in, in Christian theology, we have now, this is the present state, at some time in the far future, Jesus will return, uh, or maybe the near future, we don't know. But sometime in the future, Jesus will return. He will resurrect all the dead, and they will be um, judged. And as it says here in Matthew 25, uh, to the unrighteous he'll say, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And then all of creation will be renewed, et cetera, et cetera. If you die today, this is the important part, if you die today, you do not go to hell or to heaven in the way that we're defining it here. You go to a place called the intermediate state. We're not talking about this, okay? So some people say, if you die tonight, will you go to hell? That's not what's in discussion. What is in discussion is here, when what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 25, after the final judgment, there's no take back sees like one place is the new creation and redemption, the other place is hell. Does that make sense? So we're not going to talk about, like, if you die today, where will you go? That's not on, not on the table. Okay. All right. So then there are three views. So the first one is eternal conscious torment. So this was most famously promulgated by Augustine of Hippo, again, writing in the 400s. Um, and he said that in the penal and everlasting punishment, the soul is justly said to die because it does not live in connection with God. But how can we say that the body is dead, seeing that it lives by the soul? for it could not otherwise feel the bodily torments which are to follow the resurrection. And there are a couple of verses that I have on your handout here that sort of uh, outline this. Um, so Revelation 14 and 20 talk about uh, everlasting torment and lake of fire and things like that. So that's the first view, eternal torment. The second view is, and this is like the most popular view. This is what most people are thinking of when, when you say hell. <clears throat> the second view is what's called conditional immortality. This is the view of uh, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, and he, said, and he was writing, note the dates here, 130 AD, so a little bit earlier than Augustine. And he said that outside of Christ, anyone who's outside of Christ is deprived of his gift, which is life eternal, and not receiving the word of incorruption, they remain in mortal flesh and are the debtors of death, not having received the antidote of life. Or in other words, whosoever believeth in Jesus should not perish, but will have everlasting life. So the opposite of life is death, not torment. That's the argument here. So in short, immortality is conditional on accepting Christ, and rejection of Christ entails destruction. Make sense? So, so, the, so uh, these people would say that the alternative view here is, uh, under eternal torment is that everybody's immortal. It's just a question of where you end up. Um, the conditional immortality person is going to say, no, actually, those that um, do not receive Christ do not receive immortality, and they will eventually cease to exist. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions about this? 
So I, I have some uh, verses on here. For example, uh, Jesus says, do not fear him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy body and soul in hell. Uh, Ezekiel 18, the soul that sin shall die. Um, Paul says the wages of sin is death. And so death in all of that context is understood as fairly literal, like cessation of life and cessation of existence. Make sense? Any questions? Yes. How clear is it that in the Bible that people who aren't going to be saved are pulled out of this intermediate state and given their bodies back? I already said we're not talking about the intermediate state. Yeah. But uh, Scripture does indicate that they come out of that. Yes. In order to yeah. experience this. So you see there's the, the little yeah. pink square that I have there. Yeah. So there's the, the, the doctrine here is what's called the doctrine of the general resurrection, which is that everybody uh, will be resurrected. In Revelation it says like the sea will give up their dead and things like that. And then all will stand before Christ to be okay. judged. Yeah, yeah, so that's where that's coming from. And they will be judged in body and soul. This is part of the argument of why the intermediate state is irrelevant because in the intermediate state you're not judged in your body because your body and your soul are separate. Right. For that clarification. Yeah, but here you're resurrected, you're reunited, and then you are judged in body and soul. Okay. So if this view is true, then the eternal torment premise is false, and the argument falls apart. Okay. Let me get through one more view really quickly. The third and final view that we're going to talk about today is universal reconciliation, and this is uh, from Saint Gregory the Great, uh, writing about um, three. Uh, 350 AD or so. And he said um, that the purpose and nature of hell was for universal reconciliation of humanity. God's end is one and one only, that whenever the complete whole of our race shall have been perfected from the first man to the last, some having afterwards in the necessary periods been healed by fire to offer every one of us um, participation in the blessings which are in him. And so a couple of verses that are used here would be 1 Corinthians 15.22, um, which says that um, I think that's all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. Could be mistaken on that one. Um, Philippians 2. So Paul, there's an interesting argument where Paul says that um, to be saved, one must confess Jesus as Lord. Um, and then Philippians 2 says every knee on heaven and on earth and under the earth will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so if you take those two together, that could be interpreted as universal salvation, a universal confession um, of salvation. So that's on your handout there. So here's a summary of those three perspectives. Okay, makes sense. And just to put like, and to put it back into our argument, the response would be, perhaps one of these other views is true. And if that's the case, then this first premise is false, and now the argument is no longer, and the problem has been resolved, for the most part. Makes sense. What was Gregory's dates again? Uh, Three sixty A.D. Something like that. Not the earliest. Correct. All right. Any clarifying questions about these? perspectives here. What does he say about the state of non-human existences, like demons, angels, stuff like that? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. So um, this is only talking about human beings. There are uh, some, and there's a book, I think I referenced it um, <coughs> on the handout, there's a book by David Powis, and he breaks down how many possible questions you can ask about hell, and he says that there are about 20 different versions of the doctrine of hell once you get into the nitty gritty. And so I've simplified that down to three. Um, so for example, under universal reconciliation, there is a view that says the demons and the devil will have eternal torment, but all of the humans will ultimately be redeemed, uh, uh, reconciled to God, right? Um, you have some annihilationists that would say that um, the devil and the demons and all them and the humans and everything that's thrown into the lake of fire, it's all annihilated. And then some of them would say, well, no, the humans are annihilated, but the spiritual beings continue in torment. Or like, there's a bunch of like mixing and, and, and matching on that. <laughs> okay. Yes. How much do people debate whether each church father actually held these? They don't. Are we sure? Because I've heard people, I've heard like Catholics or Orthodox say, well, no, Irenaeus and Gregory held ETC. I've heard at least for Irenaeus, I think there's some. Yeah. 
maybe some debate over that because he's not super clear in, against heresy. Yeah, uh, the problem is that most of these debates, um, like the positions were developed later on, like in the sixth century, um, and then they're being retrojected back onto these early uh, early fathers, and and they were more like, for example, against heresies is more against uh, like the Arians and stuff. He's not concerned with uh, <coughs> that. But yeah, but the point is that you can draw support from their writings um, for these views. But I don't. But again, like. <coughs> Coming from as a Protestant from a Protestant perspective, like these guys probably contradict themselves, so there's no like desire for consistency or ne there's no need for consistency on their part. Okay. All right. So let's return to the argument then. So premise one: eternal torment, hell consists of eternal torment, body and soul. Well, perhaps that's not true. If that's and perhaps there um, there's a different biblical perspective on this. Now I did really skirt over the biblical justification for these perspectives. I have on the back in the appendix um, a detailed analysis of a couple of common texts. If time permits, we can circle back to that. But um, I want to look at some alternatives and make sure that we have enough time to, to look at them. Okay. So that's one way out of the problem: deny that uh, hell is eternal torment. All right. Let's look at the second one. And the second perspective, or sorry, the second option is to deny that hell is retributive um, in its purpose. That is to say that um, it is designed to mete out punishment that people deserve in this life. Okay? Here's a very famous example. So C.S. Lewis, here's a summary of his view. Sin is a human being saying to God throughout their whole life, go away and leave me alone. Hell is God's answer. You may have your wish. Lewis says that there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, in the end, thy will be done. And those that are on hell ultimately choose it. So this is the perspective of like the great divorce. Um, it's a uh, sort of novella describing um, Lewis's kind of take on, on the nature of hell. Here's another more technical uh, exposition of that. This is from Eleanor Stump. Um, she, was, she said that basically this is like drawn from Dante's Inferno. That's not relevant here. But basically uh, what she argues is that what God does with the condemned is to treat them according to their second nature, which is the acquired nature that they've chosen for themselves. He confines them within a place where they can do no more harm to the innocent. And in this way, God recognizes their evil nature and shows that he has care for it. Because by keeping the condemned from doing further evil, he prevents their further disintegration and their further loss of goodness and of being. And so basically on this idea, um, in rejecting God, these people have essentially chosen dehumanization. But God won't let them become completely dehumanized, and so he allows them a sort of quarantine space where they can just exist sort of on their own. But God's not present there. They're isolated. There's no one else that they can harm. Um, and they're just sort of in, in, the, in um, yeah, kind of in solitary confinement, if you will. And so there's no torment, of, there's no God like setting them on fire or demons poking them with sticks or anything like that. There are mosquitoes. So what do we think of this perspective? Here I'll go back to the Lewis quote because I think that's a little more clear. So what do we think about this? In this way, eternal torment, it's not like you earned a bunch of punishment. You earned an infinite amount of punishment in this life. It's you, you chose to live a life that is not very pleasant. What do we think? In that case, couldn't people choose eventually to go out, out of it, too? Yeah, so like Lewis also says famously that hell is locked from the inside, that people stay there constantly of their own free will. That's like real famous. I, I think the point is that the people who choose to be in hell are the people who are never going to choose to not be in hell. Yeah. I, I know the Eastern Orthodox... That's kind of the whole point of the, the great divorce, but... <laughs> I know at least for, for some of the Eastern Orthodox, that is similar to a position that they'll hold, where they'll say, basically, <coughs> hell is a person's chosen separation from God, but if a person chooses to come back to God and to unite themselves to God once again, then that, that is still a possibility for reconciliation. So would you ever have, like, on that view, some sort of universalism end up coming out? or? Yeah, I think it's, it's like a contingent fact that universalism is false. 
It could be the case that people come out, but they just won't because of their nature, right? That, that's, that's what um, Lewis is getting at with the whole locked from the inside metaphor, is that these people have chosen uh, a path that makes them increasingly more dehumanized and increasingly more resistant to God. So what do we think? Yes? I think it's the, the, pro yeah, the problem I have with this one is because of how, fair, how, how volatile we are in our nature in our finite lives here, and mm -hmm. it seems, um, and it, it seems odd to assume that we would never change yeah. after death. Um, but that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think to, to kind of go to bat for this view for a bit, one aspect of this is saying that once you've separated yourself from God, you've also separated yourself from God's grace, and God's not going to intervene anymore. And once you've separated yourself from God's grace, there's not really any opportunity to come back. That would be kind of like the, the style of argument. But to your point, yeah, like I, 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 I see what you're saying. Yeah. It seems like hell is still uh, pictured as this place of incredible suffering. So I don't think this is uh, a significant objection to the view, but you do have to be careful mm -hmm. as far as describing how exactly that suffering arises. Uh, yeah, yeah. In this case, it's a suffering of one's own making. I think I would want to, if somebody espouses this view to me, I would want to prod in on, on the details of what exactly you think that is, but... Yeah. So, in this view, if if they still have bodies, I'm assuming, and like mm -hmm. bodies sold together, but they're separated from God, if God sustains all things and endures all things and is lifting up and keeping all things basically going, what mm -hmm. does that even mean, to be separated from God? Yeah, this is a very good question, and this is actually one argument annihilationists will make. Yeah, you're separated from God, okay? Who's supplying your existence? You're separated from the one in whom we live and move and have our being. That's annihilation, right? Uh, very good argument. But one thing that, I don't wanna to get too deep in the weeds here, but like, so Stump is coming at this perspective as a, as a Thomist, okay? And so in Thomist uh, philosophy, there is like a very strong commitment to, um, you can't, God can't bring things out of being because that, that is actually the definition of doing something that's evil. And so like in the, in the um, Summa Theologia, like Aquinas basically argues, it, whenever he's treating hell, he, he explicitly says like, God cannot bring them out of being because that's, that's, that's actually evil. And that's <laughs> worse than letting them continue in existence. Being so, not being yeah, yeah, because if, yeah, the worst thing to do in, in the Thomist understanding of things, the worst thing to do is to take away something's being. I know, it's a little backwards, but like that's why Stump is, and, and Dante to a lesser extent, like they're kind of coming at that with that, um, with that assumption in mind. Yes? Would, um, would you like have to, for salvation or whatever, would it have to be like some inclusivism like thing that you'd have to take if you take this? Because um, like all the um, people who deny God would be like, I won't like be done or whatever. Or God yeah. says that to them, but then the yeah, yeah. I will be done thing is those who like profess God. Yeah, yeah, th th this is a good point. Yeah, and so Lewis, I don't want to misrepresent him, um, but Lewis is is well known as being as an, uh, is well known as being an inclusivist. So he does think that there are paths of salvation outside of Christianity. Well, not outside of Christianity, but like outside of explicit knowledge of Christ, right? So that is part of where he's coming from on on this front. Uh, with Stump, she is coming, of course, from a Roman Catholic perspective, and um, I think, I don't know if it's like dogma, but it's definitely a view within Roman Catholicism that people at their deathbed have a sort of last option where God sort of um, appears to them as they are dying and says, this is your last chance, right? And so in that case, like both of these perspectives do sort of have like a, everyone's aware. But yeah, it's a very good point. Okay. Anything else? Any other comments? I think my hang up with this one would be if God is an omniscient God, mm -hmm. saying you may have your wish almost indicates that given any circumstances in any life you could have lived, God saying, I know you wouldn't have chosen me, but mm -hmm. not everyone's given the same circumstances. Like not everyone, not everyone has a road to Damascus moment right. in their life. So is this saying 
that no matter the circumstances I had put you in, you would have chosen to walk away from me? Or is your free will a result of the circumstances mm -hmm. you were born into? Yeah, another great question. Uh, so there's a doctrine in philosophy called transworld depravity, which is just that, right? That any those that are condemned would have been condemned in any circumstance of their own free will. I don't know that this perspective necessarily commits you to that. But I think it does say, like, because like, like Nathan was getting at, um, given Lewis's inclusivism and presumably, I don't, I don't want to be too presumptive, but Stump's sort of last option view, that those circumstances have been brought about. Like it is the equivalent of a road to Damascus event um, on, on that case. So I think that there's a little bit there. All right. So I have some concerns with this. Here's my main concern. Bible. <laughs> There's like no biblical evidence for this. This, this. this is the problem, right? And this is, this is like the issue. The language in scripture is retributive. Like it just is. So I don't think that this perspective necessary, while it's a very good philosophical perspective, and there are very good philosophical defenses for this view, I am not convinced that there is an adequate wrestling with the language in scripture. So that's what I think is the main hang up there. Um, there may be some outs, but I think it's, it's, it's really struggling. So if you take this route and deny the retribution thesis, then perhaps hell isn't retributive, but a natural consequence of voluntary, voluntarily isolating oneself from God. And if that is the case, then the problem goes away, right? Because God's not giving eternal punishment. He's allowing persons to fulfill the life that they want to do. Okay, this leads to the uh, third and final one. Eternal torment is an unjust punishment for a finite earthly life, no matter how evil. Okay, so this is, if we deny this one, then we can have eternal torment and we can have retribution uh, together. Yay, we did it, yeah. So um, there's essentially, for the sake of simplicity, there are a bunch of arguments, it's really sophisticated, but there's essentially one main argument, okay? And it comes from Aquinas, but it's picked up by like Calvin and Edwards and Turretin, like it's a really popular argument. And it's called the statist argument, okay? Um, I am not gonna read all of this, but there are essentially two parts to it. The first part is um, one that I think we're more familiar with, where um, Aquinas gives this analogy of uh, saying that the, gr uh, the severity of an evil is proportional to the status or the worth against whom it is committed, okay? So to give an analogy, if someone came up to me and slapped me in the face, okay? That's not really a big deal. I probably deserve it, truth be told. But like, that's not good. What if someone goes up to Miss Rev, Revely, and slaps her in the face? Death, believe it or not. <laughs> yes. Because she is of a much, much higher status and worth, okay? Metaphorically speaking, what happens if you slap God in the face? Well, this is an infinite, total, like, egregious uh, sin that has been done against someone of infinite value, okay? And if that's the case, then perhaps that uh, sin, if it is proportional to the status against whom it is committed, is in fact maximal in value because God is maximal in value. Sidebar, someone did slap God in the face and his response was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Into that sidebar. But anyway, point being, Kind of though, like, uh, he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. No, not, not quite. Um, but sort of. But yeah. But yeah. But that's basically the argument. And so Aquinas cashes it out in this way. Punishment is proportionate to sin. And sin consists of two things. First, in turning away from an immutable, infinite good. And in that respect, sin is infinite. And turning towards a mutable, finite good. So that sin is finite but the turning away part um, is infinite. And so accordingly, insofar as sin consists in a turning away from something, its corresponding punishment is the pain of loss, which is infinite, because it is the loss of the infinite good, which is God. And so, Aquinas argues, in turning away from God, who is the infinite good, one has warranted for oneself infinite punishment. What do we think? Are we gonna buy it? Sell it? I mean, I think you indicated uh, it, it kind of feels like 
in order to be culpable <coughs> that specifically, uh, you would have to have enough awareness mm -hmm. that, that your sin was directly against God. So you'd have to... Pr it would almost like... Said contra. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, it does play into a penalty sometimes. I, I would also add, and I was thinking kind of the same thing, this is where uh, sort of the first part of, like I was reading the Westminster Confession, mm -hmm. that's actually what it starts to address. It basically says every human being has enough of a knowledge of God just given by general revelation so sure. as to leave men inexcusable of their sin. Sure. But yeah, I think you'd have to have some sort of principle like that. That, Yeah. Yeah, but I think that here we're just kind of looping back into last week, which is what happens to those who don't hear about the gospel. In this case, we can presume everyone knows all about Jesus and still says no um, in this case. Would that still, would that, would, would that still warrant it? Right. I think that helps. Okay. Yeah. Anybody buy this argument? Anyone else have concerns about it? Yes. You buy it or you have concerns? Uh... Or both. Uh, the, 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 like, I, I, would, I, I just know that I would treat somebody who um, slaps two different people. I would yeah. treat them differently depending on... Yeah, there's a degree. There's a degree of intuition there, for sure. For sure. Well, here are some concerns. Well, first, any other comments? Yes, Michael. I, I think Sam's original point was still kind of right like, say you're given, you get like two buttons before you, and someone's like, uh, something bad might happen if you push one of those, and you're like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll risk it out, and you blow up the entire universe. Be like, well, you're now just responsible for blowing up the whole universe, but at the same time, okay. like, you didn't realize it was going to be that bad. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. But let, like I said, let's, let's just scope it down to someone who has heard the gospel and still says no, Re actively rejects the gospel. Then does this argument go through? I do think it's interesting how when you talk about like he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit and there's this unforgivable sin notion, I don't mm. know if it quite ties, but there's this idea that being who he is against the Holy Spirit, yeah, to turn and to go blaspheme against him is just something that doesn't, it can't be wiped away. Sure, sure. But the question is, does it warrant eternal torment? So, here are two concerns that I have on this. Here's the first one. This is transfinite arithmetic, and this is a problem. So, think about it like this. Justice deserves an infinite punishment, right? So, justice deserves an infinite punishment on this view, assumption. Um, justice will never be achieved because after one day in hell, you have one day of torment. After two days, you have two days of torment, at what point are you going to add up to an infinite amount of torment? Never, right? So justice will never be achieved. That's a problem, I think. So we might can retool it and just say maximal. And so this is maximal torment, et cetera. Um, but I think that's, that's a problem. So the second concern here is why are we favoring the status of the offended over the offender? So I pointed out one case where the intuition points in the direction of you know, you slap me, I'm nobody, it doesn't matter. You slap, like, you know, um, you know, Miss Rev or, you know, Julie, she's not here. You know, someone who of, of better status, higher status than myself, that's a greater, uh, greater crime. But here's a counter um, intuition for you. So these two gentlemen, who I will not name, uh, were both found uh, sexually promiscuous outside of their marriages. One of them is a pastor. And, or not a pastor, uh, one of them is a spiritual leader, a Christian, formerly, um, he's dead now, um, and whenever the revelations came out, it was a huge deal, major ordeal, because, oh, this man is such a, he's such a paragon of virtue, he's, you know, he's a Christian. The other gentleman was a well-known, uh, not, he's a playboy, if you will, who slept around with women, and so whenever it came out, ah, he cheated on his wife, it's like, well, also in the Pope is Catholic, right? Like, we already knew this. And so here, they both violated the sacred balance of marriage, but in one case, it's like, this is a serious issue. In the other case, it's, yeah, well, we kind of knew that he did that. And so in this case, we actually have a counterintuition. 
which is that the status of the person committing the act actually has an influence on the severity of the crime. Now, does this undermine the original argument? All it does is just cast a little bit of doubt on that, on the, the warrant there. Did you have a comment, Sam? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would say that this is a counterintuition, as in it goes in the opposite direction. I think it's just a parallel consideration. A parallel consideration? Yeah, like both, both can be true without contradiction, as far as I see. Um, perhaps. Yeah, I, I suppose one, one, could, one could do that. But the point is that, like, Aquinas kind of just says, look, the status of the sin is who it's against. It doesn't matter who's perpetrating it. So in this case, it's like, well, in this case, we're, we might have some, it, it might be more complicated than that. Okay. So, I, I think I would definitely admit that it is more complicated than yeah. that. So in trying to phrase it as a response to the argument, would we say something along the lines of, well, on the one hand, the sin was committed against God, who is infinite, therefore it is infinite in its evil, but on the other hand, it was committed by a human being, which right. is, like, it, it, yeah, you exactly. it proportionally, it would be so unimportant that it wouldn't warrant. I, yeah, I, I, I yeah, see where right. you could maybe go along those lines. Yeah, in fact, you could even put it, well, the other aspect here is, uh, depending on your view, well, this is a totally depraved human who's given over to sin. What were you expecting them to do, right? In which case, it kind of seems like the trap has been set from the beginning, so it might actually make it worse. But yeah, go ahead. And I think also, we, uh, this ties back to something mentioned earlier with one of the others, is we need to be looking at Bible verses more and less our intuitions about things, because, mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, just with examples like this, human intuition about <coughs> what, is, what sin is worse than another is yeah. culturally based and yeah, exactly. Yeah. Also, yes. one of these men has much more um, spiritual responsibility. True. Yeah. true, true. It, I think yeah. there is biblical warrant, at the very least, for this intuition, where you have statements like, well, those who teach will be judged more mm -hmm. harshly. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, let's see. Let me check on the handout <laughs> where we are. Okay, so now we're at the final option here, and then we should be able to discuss all of it together. So the final option, this is called the continuing sin thesis. Um, for the life of me, I could not find the original source uh, for this, but it is allegedly um, uh, from D.A. Carson. I've heard from other people, though. And the argument goes something like this. Are we to imagine the denizens of hell as contrite, loving God and neighbor? If not, then they continue to sin and add more time to their sentence, much like a prisoner who behind bars murders one of the inmates and then adds on to the sentence that was already there. And so in this way, they are always and continually adding on more and more years and without end as long as they are uh, within hell. And that amounts to eternal torment. <coughs> Make sense? Any confusion about what this is? Yes. So uh, would this not be creating an actual infinite by successive addition? Um, no. It's because it's just n plus one, right? It, the amount, your time at any given point is finite but you will just never reach it. Because on your first day in hell, you accrue two days more time. And on your second day, you accrue four days. And on the third day, you accrue, et cetera, et cetera. That's how, what this is. Yes? So if it is finite, like in this case, it's like, is, with this argument, is there any way to like get out? Uh, yeah, th this would also kind of uh, hold to that other position, which is that there kind of isn't, but, well, uh, see how it starts out. Are we to imagine them as contrite? So it's kind of saying, are we to imagine these people that have already turned their back to God, they have turned away every single possible option, are they now going to start repenting? Probably not. In fact, a torturous or tormentuous environment might drive them to despise God even more than they already do. And so it doesn't seem like there's any uh, turning away in that option. But yeah, on this, on this view, you also have the other issue of like, they're kind of contingent. It just happens to be the case that they're they're locking themselves in. You can work your way up to annihilation. <laughs> you can work your way up. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Yes, Michael. Is this implying that if they stop sinning, then their good works can get them into heaven? Mm -hmm. So we move on to some concerns. <laughs> Let's start with the first one. Um, the, what Michael said, yes. Uh, the, can you work your way out of hell? That seems a little problematic, right? But the more important issue, like the more serious one is like, again, this, th this just doesn't have any independent warrant. It seems like 
uh, it is merely being proposed um, to sort of back justify why it is that hell is eternal. And again, pretty much everything in scripture is uh, saying that whatever the punishment that's experienced in hell is for this life. What does Jesus say in Matthew 25? Depart from me because you didn't feed the hungry, you didn't clothe the poor, you didn't look for the widow, look after the widow, etc. There are no poor or orphans or widows in hell for them to look after. So it's not like they have anything to even do. It's not, it's not only that their good works could get them out, it's that there are no good works to be done, right? Because in hell there are not, none, of these, none of these people um, that um, were neglected in, in this life. So I think that's the, the, the main uh, concern there. But I think that the other issue was, was kind of what, what, what she was bringing up earlier is that this claims to be a defense of the traditional view, but it oh, like directly opens the door to a bunch of non-traditional ideas, such as, well, if they just stop sinning, can they leave? Or uh, if they repent, can they? Like, it, it seems very unclear. And we also have this issue of like, if they are committing additional culpable acts, then maybe they actually have free will in hell. And if they have free will, then yeah, what's to stop them from leaving? These are questions that are brought up by this possible idea. So. I don't know. I think it would commit you to the retributive view. Uh, so if you try to get out of the retributive view earlier, <coughs> yeah. of these responses were there. Well, right. So this is an independent response. Yeah. So this is the summary. So we have eternal torment. We talked about some possible... Uh, reasons why that might be the case. And so this is this is just targeting premise three, which is eternal torment is an unjust punishment for a finite earthly life, no matter how evil. Well, perhaps it is the case that you can commit an infinitely grave sin by offending an infinitely holy God. And perhaps whenever you're in hell, you continue to accrue a finite number of sins anyway. These are actually contradictory in case you didn't notice. Like you can't have both of them. You either say like you can... You can have one and three. And you can uh, have one and two. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. The, these three, uh, like, you have to deny at least one. Yeah. You no, can deny all three. You can deny, you can deny any of them. You yes. Can, you can deny one and three. Yes. You can deny one and two, but you can't deny both two and three. Uh, no. Wait. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. So, um... Anyway, yeah, so th this is the case is, yeah. So the, you essentially have two options, which is it is just because you can commit an infinitely grave sin in this life, or it's just because you have an unending number of finite sins that are committed in hell. That's the idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, yeah, but, but Aleph not plus one is Aleph not, so it doesn't matter. All right, so now we return to our poor friend, okay? So he's concerned about the justice of hell. So as a recap, Francine said, well, there are actually alternatives. Uh, Irenaeus and Gregory, they didn't agree with the eternal torment view. One of them was uh, the Bishop of Rome, so it's not like you're obviously a heretic if you disagree with this perspective. Um, Muffy is saying, uh, well, no, actually, didn't you read C.S. Lewis? Uh, hell is locked from the inside, and that's a freely chosen uh, state of existence, so you don't have to worry about God tormenting or torturing people. And Binky says, actually, Arthur, no, God is holy and infinitely mighty, and if you spurn him and reject him, that is, an, that is a crime of infinite punishment, um, worthy of infinite uh, and unending torment. So those are the perspectives, okay? So should we take a poll or we'll just open it up for discussion? Is anyone on team Binky? Okay. We have a, Binky's on the bottom. Never mind. Who agrees with who agrees with Arthur? Why is it just the problem? Yes, who has a problem? Everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Starting at the top, who agrees with the short haired monkey? That's what she is. It's canonical. Okay. Where's the where's the universal restoration one? I don't think it's on the Oh. Um, yeah, that would be the first one, yeah. So, sorry, yes. Francine specifically is an annihilationist. But you can also just agree with the first half of her sentence. Actually, Arthur, the Bible doesn't teach eternal torment. 
Okay, we'll just take that. So who agrees with Francine? We're going to get rid of eternal torment. Okay. Who agrees with Muffy in the middle that hell is not about punishment? Okay. All right. And then who's going to agree with Binky? Like, suck it up. <laughs> Cope. Okay, we got two. Two and a half. All right. Who, who's with the dad in the corner and saying, I have no idea? There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so any any questions? We actually have like a decent amount of time for discussion. This is rare. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, B? There's someone else has a question? Yeah. She can go first. Okay, okay ladies. Okay, first. My, my question is what, what's the biblical source for annihilation? I'm because glad whenever, you asked. Whenever we talk <laughs> about hell from the Bible, it's either the yes. man that's yes. tormented. Yes. Great question. In our final minutes, allow me to answer this with my remaining 38 slides <laughs> that are in the appendix. So, genu very good question. So I think most of us are probably on board with like, can we just like figure out what the Bible says, right? Okay, first question, why is there interpretive disagreement about this? And the reason is because there isn't actually an authoritative single literal description of hell in the Bible. Um, there are only metaphorical descriptions. And we know this because the Bible, or Jesus says, it's a lake of fire and it is outer darkness. Riddle me this. What kind of a fire is dark fire? Other than the flame of Udun. I know. I, that's, I, yeah. I don't know a lot about those. Yeah, Jesus in the first century is talking about dark matter. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so they're, they're referencing different parts. So the thing is that we have to talk about metaphors, but saying it's a metaphor doesn't get rid of the problem. So it's a, metaphor. a metaphor for it's what? Not, I mean, it's not something that yes. Jesus authoritatively said, this is what hell is like. Exactly. And so the metaphor, so metaphors have three parts. They have a target, which is the thing that's being described. They have a referent, which is the thing that's being used for comparison. And then they have a sense, which is the thing that brings them together. So for example, we can say that Jesus is, um, or sorry, and the, and the thing is that everyone agrees, hell and fire, like these are together, but we don't agree on the sense. So, for example, we can say that Jesus is the lamb in the sense that both are sacrifices, but not in the sense that they both have four legs. Jesus did not have four legs. So, we agree hell is a fire, but, it, but in what sense? Fire is used, it's painful, it's also used for destroying things, and it's also used for purifying things. So, what, so when we say hell is fire, is it for pain or destruction or purity? And so one of the things that uh, Ada brings up here is like, oh, well, we'll go to the rich man and Lazarus, right? Jesus tells this parable, 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 flag, hold on just a second, parable about a man uh, named Lazarus, um, and uh, a rich man and, uh, and a man named Lazarus, and a poor man named Lazarus, that the rich man is mean to the poor man, and then, in the after, and then when they die, uh, the um, rich man goes uh, into the fire, and Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom. But the most important thing is that while this is commonly referenced, it doesn't actually answer the question because it is a parable, okay? Parables are never taken literally. In fact, and most importantly, the settings are not taken literally. N.T. Wright has a very good, he's one of my favorite scholars, he says that when you tell a parable about New York City, you don't use that parable to find where the Empire State Building is. Using a parable of New York City as a map of the city is wrong. And likewise, we can't use this as a map of the, uh, the afterlife. And secondly, it gives the wrong message because Jesus says at the very end, therefore watch out for hell. No, he says at the very end, therefore be nice to poor people, right? Like that's, he's not talking about it. Like this is not, this is incidental at best. And if you didn't agree with me on those two points, it's the wrong time. Because what does the rich man say? He says, please let me send somebody back to the world of the living to tell my uh, family members about this terrible fate that awaits. So all of the story is in this little yellow box that we said, it, you can say whatever you want about the red box and it's consistent either way. So it's ultimately irrelevant, right? Like this is, this is and, and so like that's, so you bring that up, but yeah, it doesn't actually answer the question. Even though it references torment, at most, e first of all, even if you took it literally, it only tells you about that time period. It doesn't tell you about the final judgment. And secondly, it's pretty clearly not describing those things. So where does the language of annihilation come from? And so the better text is a reference in uh, Mark chapter 9. 
Jesus says, if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into Gehenna, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. One may think, oh, unending fire and undying worms. That's torment. Except, what happens when a dead body is thrown into a pile of undying worms and undying flame? The body is destroyed. The worms eat all the flesh, and the fire consumes everything that's left over. And so this language comes specifically from Isaiah 66. So Isaiah says, um, for as the new heavens and the new earth, so notice that, new heavens and new earth, so we're post-resurrection here, which I will make and shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants in your name remain. From new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And they shall go out and look at the dead bodies, the corpses, of the people who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. So the language here, specifically, like this is a, an actual place in, uh, in Israel, right here on the map, called the Valley of Gehenna. This is a trash heap that's being referenced. And so met the metaphor here is, how can you draw a torture chamber out of a picture of a trash heap? It seems more in line with destruction, annihilation, total you know, all of that business. So in this way, we have the referent of the corpses. Remember our metaphors, we have reference, sense, and target. So the referent of the corpses, this is a pictorial, de uh, um, pictorial depiction, it's a little redundant, of, uh, of death in body and soul. So like when Jesus says, be afraid of him who destroys body and soul in Gehenna, this is the picture. Be afraid of him who casts your body into an undying fire pit where it will be completely destroyed. And the same with the fire and the worms. These are agents of consumption that devour and obliterate anything in the path. And there are other references as well that refer to God and God's judgment as unquenchable fire, consuming fire, explicitly in the book of Amos, reducing to nothing whatever it touches. So, again, this is the argument. The argument is that the reference to fire is, especially in terms of judgment, is consistently on this picture of you know, annihilation and destruction. So that's kind of the, the core argument that, I, that would be made for the annihilation perspective. Okay. Does that answer your question? <laughs> what about the smoke of torment that rises forever? An excellent question. <laughs> what about the smoke of torment that rises forever? <laughs> so yes, this, this is the, the line in uh, Revelation. And, here's the, and what's interesting is the, the conditionalist is going to argue if you read the book of Revelation, torment is always tied to destruction. So um, the interpreters will point out it's the same language used for obliteration. Uh, so in Revelation 18 to 19, the kings of the earth will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning, the smoke of Babylon. And they will stand off in fear of her torment, saying, alas, the great city of uh, Babylon, in one hour your judgment has come. Her smoke goes up forever and ever. The great city is thrown down and will be found no more. So again, does that sound like the city is being tortured? Or does it sound more like the city is being destroyed? That would be the argument there. So here's the assessment from Ben Witherington III, which I think is pretty accurate. He basically says, look, you can, you can slice the baloney any way you want, and either view is possible. If I were a betting man, I would say that the conditionalists are probably, like, or probably right, but I don't really know. Because the imagery is so imagic and metaphorical. Like we're making arguments about parables and apocalypses and metaphors and prophetic visions. It's not like Jesus comes out and says, okay, here is you know, a literal description of what it looks like. We don't have a Dante's Inferno like level description. Even Dante's Inferno is uh, usually interpreted as metaphorical anyway. So, anyway, so that's, that, the, the point of all that is just to show that there is very strong biblical argument that underlies uh, the annihilation perspective. You, and I can make a slightly weaker case for the universal position. But there is also scripture you can do that. So let me back up to, OK, back up to where we were. Yes, sir. Go ahead. So my question is, it seems like a lot of these end up having the same, or oh, a lot of it kind of boils down to, or is contingent upon whether or not you think that um, souls after death have free will, um, yeah. or in, have free will in general. Um, yeah. Because if they do believe that souls after death have free will, then they could 
change their mind and, and, and want to follow God. Yeah. Um, and even if God withdraws his grace from them, then the problem is, well, like, can a God who loves his enemies knowingly leave them to that when yeah. he knows that he could redeem them? Yeah. So, yeah. Is, is there, is there any, like, are there any talk, people who talk about that? Or yeah, that? so, like, free will in the afterlife is a huge, huge, huge question. Because you also have the inverse problem about free will in heaven. Mm-hmm. If you have free will in heaven, will there be another fall into sin and evil? Um, so, yeah, it's a very active uh, debate. And this is one strength of the annihilationists. They deny free will because they deny existence. <laughs> Easy peasy, right? No leftover bits. So they don't have to deal with that. But yes, I think that you're right that particularly like the continuing sin view or the hell is lo- locked on the inside view, like they do have to make additional assumptions about what kinds of options are available and choices and contingent decisions. So. Um, that could also could not also be almost the same as infinite punishment. Yes. So so yeah, like you're separated from God, and yeah. that's considered to be punishment in itself. Right. Yeah. That's the argument. Right. Is that it is total and complete. Like, what more and greater destruction or punishment could there be than everything that you are being pulled out of existence? Right. It's like the cosmic death penalty. You have to hold to some kind of eternal punishment. That, like Jesus does talk about, yes, these people will be punished forever. The question is just, what kind of punishment are we yeah. talking about? Granted, universalism does not hold to an eternal punishment, right. unless they be contingently. Sure. But. Okay. So I appreciate your time. We will now adjourn and continue our discussion uh, in the in the in the after. So. Um, on the back, there is a nice description of those three passages that I went through, as well as a bunch of resources. There is uh, a great video on our YouTube channel from like two semesters ago, or last semester, that I'd recommend. So that's that.